just a couple of miles away, and uh, we built a real good set of blades. But uh, later on, uh, you know, for production, these blades were fine up to a point, but uh, we were looking for uh, we were looking for a better blade, and we also wanted to get a bigger diameter. We uh, we had two what they call a too high a disc loading for a gyroplane. You've got to keep the disc loading down so the rudder has to get bigger. If it gets bigger, you want to reduce the core. So we looked everywhere for production blades. And the only place we could find a suitable blade was Enstrom. Now they're in Menominee, Michigan. And this is part of one of their blades. Very simple construction just a, what, a single extrusion at the front and a couple of bits of skin, and that's it. Bonded together, of course. And uh, as soon as we, we put these blades uh, on the older aircraft, and uh, when we had these old blades, we used to be able to struggle up to about 5,000 feet. We put these on, and the fellow was right up at 11,000. So it made an enormous difference, and for no increase in weight. And uh, of course the rotor speed was about the same because the, uh, the cord was smaller. So we got an enormous improvement. Now, problem, uh, we actually wanted uh, flat blades. We didn't want any twists in them because uh, uh, for a gyroplane, especially when you're pre-spinning, you want to spin it up flat. But uh, Armstrong at the time said, well, we only got this one fixture and that's for our helicopter blades. So we had to accept a twisted blade. Now this is a half a degree of foot twist, which a lot of helicopters have. Now what we actually did, um, we turned the blades the other way because uh, with uh, gyroplanes, if you have any twist at all, it's, uh, you want it a little bit coarser at the tip of the root. But really, for simplicity, you should have them flat. And then you get a good spin up, and I don't think the performance is compromised anyway. Now, we started off with a, a four foot diameter fixed pitch propeller, which our project engineer said was all we needed. So. Uh, we, this was a one foot core, four foot diameter, and uh, it had a, a duct around it. Now, the idea behind the duct is to um, increase the static thrust. You get a tremendous amount more thrust. And we're not carrying it around just to increase the thrust. It's also the tail surface that keeps the uh, aircraft going in the right direction and also it gives us somewhere to hang the rudder. The rudder is right behind the propeller, so that you've got tremendous directional control. And uh, with a, a hinge offset, a nice big hinge offset, tremendous control over this aircraft. You know, pitch and roll was just unbelievable. And uh, so when we put these Armstrong blades on, we, instead of turning them counterclockwise, American helicopters all go counterclockwise. Who, who cares which way they go, really? So when we put these on, to get the twist coarser at the tip, we turn them clockwise. Now that had the effect. You just you have to turn them over. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. So yeah. But I mean, they're, it's a symmetrical section, so anyway. So we turn them the other in a clockwise direction. Now. You've got a propeller at the back, which is going counterclockwise, which is trying to roll the aircraft one way. And uh, all helicopters, uh, the stick starts to sort of move off to one side <coughs> as you increase forward <coughs> speed. And by turning the rotor clockwise, we compensate it so that when we fly straight and level, the stick goes right down the middle of the cup. Yep. Right. Now after 
we, uh, we didn't have too much success with uh, a four-foot diameter fixed-pitch propeller. So uh, we decided to increase the diameter, and we went up to what we actually did was so we got hold of a, a propeller from a CB, and uh, CB, of course, is a pusher, and uh, this was a CB propeller that had gone through some tel telephone wires, so uh, it had some pretty bad nicks in it, so we sort of saw this blade off, and it came out to five foot three diameter. So we thought, well, let's uh, test this blade, test the CB propeller inside a, a new duct, five foot three diameter. So we stuck that in there, and of course, the blade cord was not sufficient. So we got enough information out of this uh, CB propeller to build a, a, a fixed pitch laminated wood prop, which we designed ourselves again. And uh, we put that in the duct, and we got a tremendous, I don't know how much thrust we got, but we got a good deal anyway. And so in October 1961, we had our first successful flight. Now we had a lot of a lot of flying, if you can call it, prior to that, because uh, even with a four-foot diameter propeller, we could still barrel down the runway and pull the stick up, st you know, pull the stick back and have a little flight. You know, I wouldn't stay there, but uh, you couldn't do this with any other aircraft. I mean, gyroplanes don't stall, so you can take off, you can go from one runway to the other. So we did all these tests without sufficient thrust, really. So when we had sufficient thrust, we knew that uh, you know free flight was possible, that there really wouldn't be any problems, and that's the way it went. And uh, so from that, from our first flight with a five foot three diameter propeller, we experimented with bigger ones. We ended up with six feet, which is probably where we should have started. And we ended. Uh, we also went from fixed pitch. We went to uh, constant speed because uh, with fixed pitch you were using up too much of the power during your spin-up. There wasn't enough left for the rotor. But uh, if you had constant speed, a little bit heavier, but uh, you got enough power left to really get that rotor going. Now we didn't get it going as fast as we'd like because these things are twisted. We were supposed to get 360 RPM and we used to get about 330, which wasn't bad since we flew it. 240. And in fact, it was still flyable at 200. We had to demonstrate that flying at 200 RPM. You know, uh, this was all part of certification. Can you imagine pulling the collective up, <laughs> getting oh down to 200? You know, I mean, it's ridiculous, but that's the sort of thing we did. How much did you have to pay the test pilot? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how much he got paid. <laughs> but. Uh, I mean, the RPM of a rotor, it, it's fixed. I mean, uh, you, you set the blades at a certain angle, and we set them at three degrees, I think it was three degrees, something like that. And uh, the method of flying this aircraft was to uh, start the engine up, and uh, then you grab hold of your, collect we had collective control on it, but uh, it was sort of, um, you had uh, full control over it, but you'd normally only need to park it in your four degrees. But uh, what we did, we had the additional collective to do spot landings uh, if required, but you didn't have to do that. Now, when uh, um, we had a pilot, Grant Davidson, who flew for us, he used to fly for the Havilands. And uh, he had no duel whatsoever on this aircraft. And uh, he had Bernie Namath and myself tell him what to do. And we'd never flown the aircraft either. And uh, we said, well, what you do is you sort of wrap this rotor up and then pull the stick up to this little lock position. There was a sort of real lock there, you know, four degrees. And then you know, you might take off, but otherwise sort of go down the runway and away you go, which is exactly what he did. Did a circuit and that was it. 
So, I mean, I mean, he's a good pilot, but uh, nevertheless, really simple. So, uh, we went through a sort of period of evolution <coughs> uh, until we got up to a six foot diameter constant speed propeller. And we went away from our uh, one foot coil blades. We went to these. As soon as we got these, we had an enormous improvement in performance, height and speed and everything else. And uh, from that, uh, we developed, uh, we actually did a complete redesign. Uh, instead of building it around a, a steel pipe, which, you know, in the end doesn't save any weight because you put the pipe in here and then you put all the fiberglass around, you might as well, might as well build it out of aluminum to begin with. So, uh, we designed a, a complete new one, which was a real sharp looking aircraft. And we started building this early 1965, and we flew in November 1965, and then started the long certification. You know, who flies it? Helicopter pilot or fixed wing? You know, we went through all this rigmarole. And uh, it's a fixed wing pilot's machine because. Uh, it flies, well, our pilot used to say it flew like a Cessna 150. And you did all the same things with it. You side slipped it and everything else. There are some gyrocopters you're not supposed to side slip, but uh, you could do anything you like with avian because we got all this control. Now, I've got a, a little bit of history, which I'll zip through on these slides. This was, uh, sure. There's a light switch for you, or for this hat. <coughs> Right back there, left hand. <coughs> I plugged in here? I believe so. Oh, is the switch at the back? Is the on a remote? Just says, man, we had it working here just a while ago. Am I doing something wrong? This, uh, sort of, uh, this is history, really. This is uh, right. Mally Wood Products in Georgetown down by the train station. And uh, this is uh, uh, probably it's March or April 1959. Hey, That's uh, Peter Payne, the project engineer, he was the one, without him this would have never started, that's for sure. And this is a, a model of the first aircraft, you can see the four foot diameter duct there, and uh, uh, the, now the first blades were actually uh, tab controlled, you can see on the, just above the telephone there's a little tab there. Now I think there's only one helicopter manufacturer ever worked with them, that was Command. They had uh, tab-controlled rotor blades, and uh, they might be fine for helicopters, but they sure aren't any good for gyroplanes. You know, we had there was so much drag, but uh, until we sort of got rid of those tabs, we, we just couldn't get the thing to work properly. And that uh, shows the propeller on the duct again. This is the design department, the avian nice aircraft. Well. There were five people who started it. Uh, we started three weeks after Avro's closed. And then uh, later on in 1959, uh, a new plant was built for us. This is where Right Way Auto Body is, if you happen to know Georgetown at all. It's all <laughs> built up, now, you know, you wouldn't recognize it now. Now, the, as I said, the first aircraft was built around a, a steel frame. Uh, the, the pylon, uh, the yellow bit at the top, is uh, a cylindrical pipe. Um, and then the rest of the fuselage uh, is a steel, not exactly a steel tube, but a steel sort of rectangular section. And all covered in fiberglass. All this fiberglass was done locally. 
now we're looking at it with one fiberglass side on the right side and the seats in place and the control column and the spindly looking landing gear which never gave us any trouble whatsoever very very simple uh, tapered steel, solid steel uh, rods and uh, we got the engine installed we got the hub on and the fuel tank up there but uh, the concept is fine you know, building around a steel pipe but it really does get complicated to get your landing gear in and your seats on and your controls and this type of thing that a lot of weight is really wasted because you're still going to put frames in for the fiberglass I'll just skip through these fairly quickly. This is uh, Peter Payne on the left, and uh, one of, we had so many people volunteer who wanted to fly it. And this is a fellow called Ron Peterson in the blue here. And uh, this was all in 1959. We didn't even get started till March or April. And this is, uh, you know, September, October. We just worked almost day and night to, to get this thing out. I don't know if you know Gord Sampson, he was uh, there right at the beginning and he was there right at the end as well. Was that the Gord Sampson who was president of the Hammond at one point? Uh, no. Or, or Boeing. Uh, uh, I think he had something Boeing called Canada? Boeing. Boeing Canada. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I guess uh, in the Winnipeg Division, yeah. latterly. Yeah. We'll take a look at that. Oh, look at that blade. No, that's a one foot cord, and it's a four foot diameter propeller. And uh, there's something that doesn't look quite right about that duct. You know, it's uh, you know the idea that you get a lot more thrust just by putting a sort of flimsy little ring around it. Uh, I don't know. It didn't seem quite right somehow. But anyway, that's the way it was. And, uh, what engine was in that at that time? An, uh, an O360. That's a 180, an icon. This was um, that first aircraft with the um, tab controlled rotors. Um, there was just too much drag. We couldn't, we couldn't spin it up properly. We couldn't track the blades properly. So we went to a regular control system. Fortunately, the control system had been designed on pilot force anyway. So much, so many pounds of the stick. So it was very, very easy to replace the um, tab controls with regular controls at the, at the root of the blade. And as soon as we did that, we had good spin-up, we had good tracking, no problems. This is our method of, I, I don't know whether people do it these days, we just have this flag here and uh, we put wax pencil on each of the blades, you know, red, yellow, and blue, and uh, someone, some brave person sticks the blade, <laughs> sticks the flag into the rotor. And you do that with the rotor flat, and you do it with the, the rotor tilted forward. What was that for? That's for tracking the rotor blades? That's for tracking. Oh, well, they're all I tracking see. in the same plane. So that the thing doesn't sort of bounce around. Those are extra rudders on well, the board of the ducts. Well, that, uh, we felt that uh, there was no that directional stability with that uh, little duct, so we put a little bit of extra on. Uh, yeah, okay. Now this, um, we went from that little tiny duct, we went to 
uh, another one, also four feet diameter. It did a little bit more for us, but not too much. So I'll just skip through this. It still, it still didn't do what we wanted it to. So now this, um, this is the aircraft that successfully flew. The um, propeller is now five foot three diameter, and uh, the pilot is Harold Kaler, a Bush pilot. Uh, I really admire these people, uh, but uh, you know he he did a good job. Got that plane flying. This is God sent some of this back to us, and uh, that proves that it actually did fly. And uh, this is after the first flight. We thought all our troubles were over at that point, and then <laughs> someone said, well, you've got to demonstrate a, a jump takeoff. So, okay, we demonstrated a jump takeoff. Now you've got to get it certified, and so it goes on. It seemed that we were always doing our testing in midwinter. <laughs> we were always up at this icy cold field up in Waterloo, Wellington Airport, either there or Guelph, and um, it was always February or March or something like that. Mind you, the performance was good, but uh, we did crosswind landings and takeoffs at Guelph, and the wind sock was absolutely horizontal. Now, who the heck wants to do crosswind takeoffs anyway, but we did, we had to, as part of our certification, and uh, there was absolutely no problem with that at all. Now, is this machine the same one? This um, is... Um, uh, different colors? or is Well, this is another one. This is... We built five of these sort of uh, yeah. older yeah. ones, if you like. And uh, I don't know quite how big this duct is. We sort of seem to go bigger and bigger. I think we are probably up to about five foot six at this point. And these are still one foot core blades. Uh, you know, we still manufacture them ourselves, and uh, uh, you know, we, we never had any problems with these blades at all. Now, uh, once we'd, uh, once we were satisfied with the jump takeoff of the aircraft, we flew it to Georgetown, so that we could continue with all our flight testing right behind the plant. This is just north of Highway 7. And we have uh, a couple of runways, as you see, which we didn't use anyway. We just used them for taxi. But uh, we could do a, a jump takeoff, no problem, with these. Well, with all the aircraft, they all did nice jumps. Now, this has nothing to do with avian. Uh, I happened to go to Sweden, and uh, I in a C-30 Autogyre. This was in 1963. We were still, we still didn't have enough performance with Avian, and so uh, I went to Sweden, and uh, they still had this old C-30 flying, and uh, so I was uh, able to have a flight in it. Now, this uh, fellow at the front, uh, Turning the propeller was a fellow called Rolf von Bauer, uh, a very talented uh, pilot, a, a Swedish pilot, who used to fly the C-30s during the Second World War. So uh, I climbed into the front cockpit. <laughs> it felt pretty hair-raising, but anyway. Uh, and there was a sort of little dinky shaft going up to give you a bit of pre-spin, and you sort of bounce along the runway and you're up. You know, it's uh, just quite amazing, really. You know, how simple it is. And here we are, we were trying to do the same thing. And that's what a bit of Sweden looks like from the C-30. Nothing could be simple than that. Now we come to, we've now rehash the aircraft completely. Uh, we put together everything that we learned from the other five, going from a four foot diameter duct to five foot three to five foot six. And now we're up at six feet. We have a heart soul constant speed propeller in there. We have a, a, a nice lightweight duct 
with, uh, that will give us plenty of directional control. We have a, a rudder right behind the propeller, which gives us uh, tremendous direction as well. And uh, the, the whole thing is sort of basically very much improved. And it's now a stress skin, just a regular Cessna type construction. Mm -hmm. And a very, very much improved visibility as well. And the engine was upgraded to the two hundred. We actually uh, we had a fuel injection uh, IO three sixty at this point to give us a uh, two hundred horsepower. Now we departed from the uh, Cessna type landing gear. Um, these legs hinge at the side of the fuselage and uh, act on rubber blocks. I think the um, twin Arta has something like that. That's relatively simple, but uh, really the, the Cessna type legs are really simple still, but uh, uh, this was what we ended up with anyway. And this has the uh, Armstrong blades on, which uh, has have the twist in, which we don't really want. Now all this was uh, in November 1965 on the occasion of the first flight. And this was the aircraft uh, that we certified. We certified it with DOT in 1968, and we got our certification with the FAA in 1969. That's Grant Davidson on the right there. And this was a, a big day for Avian. All the family and friends arrived. Now this is uh, something of interest. This is um, this is uh, an Avro design. And actually, the first slide that we didn't see was an Avro design, but this was one that uh, was proposed in the project department of Avros. So we were already looking at these things, uh, you know, before the uh, Avro collapsed, and. Uh, this was um, uh, the sun. I can see something that says air motor there, and uh, the idea was to uh, do the spin up with a compressed air, pipe the uh, compressed air down the blades out to the tip. In fact, this is how we were actually going to. This is how the avian was going to run it initially. Uh, we were going to pipe compressed air up through these tubular blades and little nozzles at the tip and uh, I think someone did a little bit of arithmetic and found that it just wouldn't work so uh, we went to a, a regular sort of belt drive spin up system. Now this is just a demonstration which I showed you just now of how flexible the straps are and that's laminated stainless steel. There's two of those on each blade? That's correct, yeah. And that's the Anstrom blade there. Now that, uh, the Anstrom blade is at the top and uh, the hollow balsa blade is the one at the bottom. It's sort of sliced in two. So it's a steel tube, uh, a solid spruce leading edge, and a, a half inch diameter steel rod is the counterbalance. You have to balance at the quarter cord. And, uh, the trailing edge is a series of balsa ribs and balsa skin. All that's covered with fiberglass. And uh, we did all our flying with those blades quite successfully. This is a little bit sort of technical here, but uh, the engine, uh, uh, this is looking on the back of the aircraft. The, the engine is uh, rotating counterclockwise, so the engine torque is trying to roll the aircraft to the right. Now if you run your blades uh, clockwise, uh, the amount of roll required to counteract the torque on the engine uh, is compensated by the normal roll that you get in forward flight, which means the stick goes right down the middle of the uh, uh, fuselage. We never had any of the, the stick sort of wandering off in any direction. 
that's the end of the slides. Now, I've got a, a pretty ancient movie here, too. Um, John, can you hit the lights? Sure. I have a, a movie of the, um, of the first flight. Uh, it's uh, taken by Kitchener TV. Uh, it's not the brightest, uh, but uh, it's of historical interest, I think. And uh, there's a little bit of sort of preamble at the beginning. There isn't any sound at the beginning. And I'll just sort of narrate what's going on. So this is, uh, this propeller is uh, 5 foot 3 diameter and uh, very, very narrow fuselage as you see, uh, you know, tandem seating as well. The wheel or pulley just above the prop there, is that part of your... That's part of the spin-up. Yeah. Spin-up, yeah. yeah. We had a belt drive off the... Uh, off the back of the engine and then a, a right angle drive which was a car differential and uh, we had a freewheeling clutch at the top and we had a, a big belt at the top. How much Terribly overstressed but you know who cares it worked. <laughs> How much power could you could you get through that? I really don't know. Uh, we just sort of we knew we were overloading everything but uh, you know, the belt manufacturer would have had, had us put one in about six inches wide, but we had it, I think, three inches wide, and it still worked. This is Harold Kaler, our first test pilot. And uh, Kitchener TV came around and took some of these pictures. This is at, uh, all at Waterloo Wellington Airport. And we're sort of, we know the camera's on us, and we're just sort of doing things here. This was still the original um, steel beam construction. The, the first five aircraft really didn't differ a great deal from each other. Uh, the only the biggest difference, I guess, was in the, uh, the size of the duct and the, uh, um, I guess, the size of the duct, basically, is the only difference. Because with a four-foot dive of the duct, the gas isn't enough thrust, that's all there is to it. This is still a, a fixed pitch propeller, so our, our performance was a little bit limited. Did you have to raise the height of the rotor blades as your ducts got bigger? Um, I don't think we did. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. We didn't do any. Uh, we didn't do any big changes. I can't. I can't remember adding. It got sort of rather close, but uh, I mean the thing is that uh, you know they come up in flight anyway, yeah. so uh, I don't remember ever hitting the block. Now this is a very gentle takeoff. This is no big jump or anything like that. So this is November 1961, October 1961. All push-up papers sound the same. It's a completely unedited movie, so it's uh, not the best. This is the first time it stayed a lot more than about three or four minutes.
pushing us on the ground. Just going down, you know, no risk capital, you know. It still seems like a totally viable aircraft. Sure. Today. The interesting thing is that uh, AMBA uh, is, I understand, is trying to get back into production again. And McCulloch, which is, you know, useless compared to this. Yeah. Well, they're trying to go back into production too. So. I don't know it's the, uh, quite what's happening. The, 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 uh, no, I don't think there's much chance, really. You said there was still one around? Yeah. Where? It's at uh, Palo Alto, California. And, uh, some people have just bought I don't know whether they think they can go into production, but uh, possibly. But all they have purchased is, the, is one machine? They haven't purchased any rights or...? They purchased the machine, they've got the certification, they've got, they got everything. they got the drawing. Well, they have everything then. Uh, so, something could happen. I don't know. <laughs> 
Did you did you make production predict projections as to what it would have cost to to market? Oh yeah. I like like what a machine would have sold for. Yeah. Originally, it was going to sell for ten thousand. Okay. Yeah. That was a few years ago. I don't know. I don't know what we're looking at. Uh, well, actually, um, no. Well, we would still we still have to produce the thing we built. Yeah, it's see, so it's still not two. But there was a uh, possibility of getting three in there. The back seat had one or two, but we certified it for, for two places. What was the gross? Why don't we watch this film and then we can ask questions uh, in an open forum? Uh, no, this is all. This is a promotional movie of the uh, production aircraft, the, the blue one that we saw. This may be the one we have on tape, is it? No, it isn't. Isn't it? No, no, those are test flights. This is good. Hang on, lights, please. This is the only couple that I have. When you when you change to the all metal <coughs> construction uh, rather than the fiberglass, did you change or what, what was the duct made out of then? Um, the duct. Uh, I'm trying to think. 
the top was made out of aluminum. aluminum. I'm, Before I'm, that, had it been fiberglass? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, it was also uh, foam filled at one time? Well, we had foam filled at one time, but uh, we got away from that. We had a, it was a fiberglass leading edge because it was quite a sort of fancy shape of mm -hmm. the leading edge, but uh, uh, the rest of it was just a very ordinary construction. The one that went to the, the, the California, is that one of the metal ones? The yeah, last that's, one? the, that's the blue aircraft. They, they've got that right now. Was there any, any, let me put it this way, how much space between the inside of the duct and the propeller tip? Not much. <laughs> quarter of an inch. Well, was it quarter of an inch? Yeah. Uh, they moved together. You know, yeah, they'd they, need to, wouldn't they? That's right, yeah. <laughs> they didn't always, but uh, we used to sort of chew the inside up. We, uh, actually, uh, what we had, we had a, uh, a foam filling just where the propeller was, and uh, it was nice and smooth, but you know, if you did happen to sort of uh, hit it, it would just sort of chew off the foam rather than chewing up some metal. But we had, like we had no problems with that. Seems like the rotors were very close to the uh, cowling. Well, it looks close, but uh, that's, you know, when it's on the ground, as soon as you get up in flight, you know, the, the blades come up. And uh, that part of our engineering was quite fantastic, actually. You know, the, um, now I didn't do this, but we had a, a very bright fellow called Dave Ferentz, who, who was from U of T, and uh, he forecast where the stick would be for, in forward flight for different load conditions. And it was just uncanny, you know. Here the stick was right within a quarter of an inch of where he expected it to be. Mm. And we did uh, varying center of gravity tests. Can you imagine hanging a 50 pound weight on the, on the duct, you know, to represent our center of gravity? I the craziest thing out. But I mean, these are the things we had to do to, to prove that we had a certain amount of CG range for, you know, two heavy weights and uh, no fuel and. Uh, you know, a little lightweight and, and all the fuel, you know, a little tipping it back this way. But we went through all that, all this laborious certification and, and the DOT wouldn't fly the aircraft until we guarantee a thousand hours on the rotor blades. Because uh, these blades, they don't have a hinge, you see, so there's quite a high stress there. And uh, uh, we put strain gauges all over the blades and, you know, find out what the stress levels are and uh, were these uh, thousand hour test periods by actual flying or by r laboratory rigs on the on the ground uh, yes. we had four blades going well, like they were going this way but anyway being pulsed backwards and forwards and it went on for 1800 hours so everyone said well forget it at this point you know then DOT Excellent. condescended yeah. to fly the aircraft that's where uh, the money went. Well, should have been into production of the craft. Oh, yeah, so but uh, we got a lot of help, too, from from our National Aeronautical Establishment and other people. But we still built the machines ourselves. We built the fatigue test machines ourselves and had to do all this cycling mounts and forwards. You know, day and night this was for, I don't know how many weeks. But, uh, um, and then all the control system had to be fatigue tested, all these little links and so on, you know, 50 million cycles. And, but uh, we got all that done at the National Air and Audio Establishment. And once we proved that, the DOT came along and flew the aircraft and eventually we got our certification. And they did some pretty horrendous things with it. You know, like crosswind landings and takeoffs with the wind sock absolutely horizontal. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know. What what was the uh, capability in crosswind? Like, they, there usually is a figure quoted, you know, 90 degree crosswind, so many knots, maximum. It was, <laughs> it was 25 knots. It was 25 knots? Yeah. It was at 90 big. degrees. That's, I, I don't know if there's any it's light any aircraft gear. certified <laughs> that will ever do that. Yeah. But of course, this, again, it was in February up in Guelph. Oh. <laughs> the wind right across the runway. The airplane took off like Well, I was going to say, there's like, we, the rest of us in the uh, home built gyro uh, world, once you get flying, if you have 20 knot wind, <laughs> you land in the wind, even if, because you, know, you can land in the woods of the runway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just that it won't be the standard approach compared to the other aircraft. <laughs> we did. Uh, <laughs> some minor detail. <laughs> and then um, we did 
zero fuel tests. This is where you uh, put a small amount of fuel in the tank. Um, uh, we suggested one gallon. Uh, the DOT fellow was there. He was witnessing. He didn't do the flying. Uh, Grant, <laughs> Dav Grant Davidson did the flying. And so he said, oh, no, we better put two gallons in. Okay, put two gallons in. So Grant Davidson takes off. This is in the blue aircraft. And uh, it sort of disappears. You know, it goes up droning on and on and on and on and on. And then finally we heard it sort of hesitate and cough, you see, and everyone comes running out. And it just takes so long for it to drift down, you know. So, I mean, it's water rotating the whole time. And uh, so it windmills all the way down. We thought, well, he'll probably put it down in the middle of the runway somewhere. No way. Grant Davidson put it down on the tarmac. <laughs> and this was absolutely dead stick. And uh, everyone thought, well, there wouldn't be any rudder control at that speed. It didn't seem to make any difference. You know, I was going to ask tested. that question if it was, there was enough air stick tested. There was enough yeah. air going through the duct and over the rudder to give us good directional control. And he lands on the tarmac. You know, why bother with the runway? So. And then that wasn't good enough. You know, that was too smooth. We had to sort of throw the aircraft around. And, uh, so we did that. And, it, and we ended up with about a little tiny bit of half a pint of gas left in the tank. So This uh, zero we, gas test was to show what? Well, uh, to show how much you, is left in the tank when it's... Fuel. When the engine quits. Yeah. Due to starvation, right. there's yeah. a certain amount of I mean, unusable that's, fuel that's right. in yeah. the tank. Unusable I fuel tests, I suppose. So you didn't have to do it in mid-air necessarily. Yeah. Well, you'd have to sort of do it to simulate regular flight, really. But uh, they made us sort of do all these gyrations with it to slot the fuel around. But uh, it still ended yes. up with only about a pint of fuel in there. So, but uh, we had our fun and games with Ministry of Transport. But uh, so, uh, uh, could you give us a rundown of the overall performance characteristics, like the specifications? Well, uh, no, our minimum speed uh, was 25 miles an hour. We could maintain straight and level flight at 25. Now, if you go at 24, you don't sort of drop out of the sky. You just sort of sink slowly to the ground. And uh, uh, the upper limit, we had a, a limit set of 100. But uh, we actually had flown considerably faster than that. But it was certified for 100, because that's what all other gyroplanes were. You know, Armbar, for instance, had a hundred, so they gave us a hundred. But uh, when we, when you flew faster than that, did you approach any problems? Not really. No, there was there was only one problem, uh, which was partly due to these blades, and uh, <coughs> this um, showed up once in a blue moon. It never showed up on the on these blades. It only showed up on these, and. Uh, uh, the blade is trying to pulse backwards and forwards. It's doing this the whole time. Actually, we actually had a camera mounted on the center of the hub on some of the earlier aircraft to observe what was going on. You could actually see the blade pulsing backwards and forwards. We knew it was we knew it was going to do this anyway, because uh, when you flap a blade up like this, it wants to do this as well. But we was constrained it with these uh, links. So most of the time, these links have a, a certain amount of tension in them, and the blade sort of merrily pulses back and forth. But just once in a while, you could actually stir the stick around if you wanted to, and you get these blades sort of flapping a little bit too far, and the, you, these links would sort of buckle. So the blade was then sort of free, and this would drive the aircraft in a little sort of oscillation, which would sort of, sort of do this type of thing, and then it would be damped out. You'd hardly even realize it had happened, but nevertheless, uh, it was there. Could and this have been, uh, I mean, this was due to pilot uh, input on the stick. Well, yeah, but sometimes, was it? sometimes it happened out of the blue, and uh, that wasn't quite as good. It never seemed to happen when the, <laughs> when the DOT pilot was flying, and it didn't, <laughs> it didn't happen, it seemed. But, uh, um, well, like, could this have been uh, due to some, like, a gust? Well, that's input, right. Transient oh, yeah. input. That's right, yeah. That's the type of thing. Now, I'm, uh, I'm convinced it was due to the fact that we had this uh, 
these twisted blades and they were two cores. I'm convinced they were two cores at the tip and set off this oscillation. But uh, as I say, it only happened once in a blue moon. It never happened. I think we had it once in about four or five years of flying with the old blades and uh, it just wasn't recognizable as being a problem at all. Because we reckoned it was, uh, it had to do with excessive flapping of the blades. Mm. That's and right. and this, a this aggravated the flapping, I believe. I think so. With the, so. With the coarser, uh, we had a choice of flying yeah. it. Uh, At a lower pitch. Uh, well, you, so the tips wouldn't be as coarse. Yeah, but uh, what we really, did, we wanted to have a flat blade. But uh, it was going to cost too much, and I think it's too bad. We had to accept these. And uh, actually, uh, we had a set of blades from Enstrom. We put them on the aircraft and flew them. And then uh, DOT wanted these fatigue tests, so we took one of the blades. It was, uh, you know, a similar to the one on the aircraft, and we put it in our test machine. And we walked in one morning. And it was in two pieces. This is after 24 hours, and the aircraft had 30 hours on it. So what do you, what do, you do? Ground it, you know? But anyway, basically, it was a, a very, very poor blade design. Uh, the root end of the blade just wasn't suitable for for what we needed. So we had a very quick redesign, which took all of three weeks, I think. <laughs> it took a number of weeks to get the new blades, and that's when we got. We went from 24 hours up to 1,800, and still going strong. And it just shows what a little bit of, you know, minor design change. It wasn't didn't add any weight, uh, and yet I can't understand why they designed blades like that. But uh, that's the way it goes. Because they didn't have to worry because they had hinges anyway. Mm -hmm. Actually, the interesting thing about Anstrom is that uh, they started off with a hingeless rotor somewhat like ours. In fact, when we started, Enstrom came along and they were climbing all over our aircraft and photographing it. <laughs> and they designed their aircraft without drag hinges. Uh, but they still have the flapping, uh, still have the flapping hinge. Now, uh, when the blade flaps up and down, it's trying to do this as well, try to wrench itself up. And uh, in Enstrom's early flight tests with the rigid rotor, that's exactly what happened. Brand new set of blades, pull up collective and all the blades would crumple up. I mean, they still hold on, but I mean, you wrecked a set of blades just during takeoff. So uh, they, they eventually went to a hinge rotor. And that's really one of the reasons that we chose their blade, because it's so stiff. We had to have this very high rigidity so that uh, the blade is sort of acting like a cantilever, so that you can never get into, I mean, if you have it uh, a sort of lateral frequency when you sort of tweak the end of 500 cycles a minute, if you're flying at 250, you're not going to be in any trouble. And, I mean, if you were sort of, if it had a natural frequency of say 250 cycles a minute, you might better get that going on the ground and the blades are all pulse buttons and forwards and you know, all of the aircraft be written up. So we never had any problems. We never had any resonance problems. But I guess we exchanged our ground resonance for this, uh, this other phenomenon. But uh, I'm convinced that with uh, untwisted blades, I think it would just disappear. The, uh, I, I'm very interested, I don't know about the, some of the other uh, members of the audience, in the uh, some more details of the rotor head, um, two-bladed rotors can uh, have the hub with a rigid connection to the blades and a single teeter uh, pin arrangement so that the blade teeters to allow for flapping action. That's right. Yeah. Once you go to three blades or more, it gets it, more a typical pro uh, right from well, Cervus early autogyro uh, development is a fully articulated uh, rotor head. In other words, you have a, a, vert a horizontal hinge for flapping and then a vertical pin for lead lag, yeah. and in which case you needed uh, substantial damping. Right. The flapping, it was aerodynamic damping, right, which you yeah. didn't have to worry about. 
but in this direction, of course, you had to have heavy damping. Yeah. And then you also have pitch control in this direction, feathering. Uh -huh. And that's the definition of a fully articulated rotor head. And I think even today, if you talk to a helicopter uh, rotor head designer, he'd be talking on those terms, except if you start to consider the um, composite composite rotor heads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, the only other three-bladed rotor that I've ever heard of was actually... Composite, composite rotor heads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, the only other three-bladed rotor that I've ever home builder in the in the U.S. Chuck Beatty, who designed a, uh, a flat, full flapping, but the lead lag was not there. However, he had a suspension system of the main rotor hub to a secondary plate that was actually attached to the shaft through. Uh, rubber mounts so that you had essentially two plates, one rigid with the shaft and the other one was sort of free, had some freedom, you know, in, through these rubber mounts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's how he got his three-bladed rotor without lead lag hinges. Yeah. Um, so I'd be interested in some detail of, of the layout of, of the head. For example, there were two of these hinges yeah. per blade. So the, these would be or straps. Yeah. Okay, that's the orientation. How so, far apart would the uh, second one be from the first one? Four inches. Four inches, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure it was only four inches. Yeah. Four inches apart. And there's a, um, a tube coming down the middle, which would... Uh, uh, give the twist or... Which moment. would give the um, pitch control. So um, you'd have... This would be the flapping. This would be the hub here. So you'd have a pin here going right through so the whole blade would flap up and down like this, and then uh, the links would do this to give to you change the, the pitch. The, the, uh, and of course yeah. they'd also do this, a little bit of this would go on as well. You couldn't have completely rigid links. But so this hinge here, was that also giving flapping? No, no, because okay. you had a, a continuous... Uh, oh, the shaft, the, the, the two all the way or into here. central then, uh, spar. So then we had links in the center of the hub uh, operated from the swash plate. And we had to put, can you imagine, we had to petite test all those for 50 million cycles. Well, we did all that too. And once we got all that done, they decided they could fly it. <laughs> but uh, no damping whatsoever. So uh, it was really simple to, to get these blades to track properly, you know, just uh, try it out once and you'd find the blue blade was lower than the yellow or something, you just crank the, the little link down here Lip and adjust it. I wonder if, if I could just have a quick peek at this. Of course, under centrifugal load, which... Which is quite big. Now, this, was carrying the, RPM. this was carrying the centrifugal load and not the center the spar. The center pipe didn't do anything. Really. That was there just for feather. That's correct. Uh, and yeah. This may actually give you a fair amount of damping, the lamination. Yeah, a little bit. What, what stopped, uh, what stopped the blades from drooping right down at rest? There was uh, this uh, tube that came in had a little uh, stop on it. A little stop was only about this long, so you can just imagine sort of this great big long blade. Anyway, that's a simple stress problem, really, but. Uh, some pretty high grade material required for that. These are fairly thin laminations. About <laughs> 20 thou or something like that. Quite thin, yeah. Pretty large. Amazing. Applying RPM, what was the centrifugal force on the blades? <coughs> like in our, in our little two place machines, or little single place jars, there's about 5,000 pounds of force in the blade. I think we had quite a lot more than that. I'm trying to think. Um, I'm sure that it was designed for 24,000, something like that, which is quite a lot. That's to take into account your overspin for Yeah. Gosh, you know, I'm 
drive for so long. We had a 360 RPM spin up, that's what it was designed for. And uh, normal flight RPM was sort of 230, 240. It, it finds its own, you know, you set, yes. you set the pitch and uh, it finds its own RPM. And it's usually around about sort of 230, 240. And uh, we actually had to artificially fly at 200 because that's what we said we would do. So here's the pilot with this <laughs> stick partially up, you know, to get to course at pitch 200 RPM. What, uh, under normal cruise conditions, what kind of, how would you describe the vibration situation? Well, our test pilot, uh, whom we uh, heard last week, said it was a bit like being in a regular helicopter, which I thought was a bit of an insult, but anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, a little bit, well, when I, I flew in the back seat as ballast, and I didn't find it too bad at all. <laughs> No, I was, Did it uh, have dual control? Oh yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So it could have been used for instruction. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Dreamer. <laughs> well, that's how the DOT pilot. He was in the. Uh, was he in the back or the front? I can't remember. <laughs> Student usually goes in the front. front. Yeah, that's right. Now that's another. Well, they were doing. Um, what were they doing? They were. They were doing uh, engine restarts. This was. Uh, <laughs> Again, it in was, the air? This was in the air. So it was February again, midwinter. And uh, so Ernie and I go up to uh, Orangeville, and uh, here's the aircraft in the middle of a runway, and uh, the DOT pilot not looking too happy. And uh, they got the thing up to seven or 8,000 feet, and they couldn't get the engine to start again. <laughs> so. You know, it's an icy cold day, they bring the thing down onto the runway, and so that was suddenly yet another thing we had to get resolved. We never had any problems before, but of course, when he got in it, we had these problems. You, you were at the, that, the little bit airport there southeast of Orangeville? That's right, yeah. Is that where the DOT? Well, that's one of the flights. I don't know why we went there, but uh, uh, that's where we did some of the flying anyway. It was uh, on the blue one, it was 200. It was an I IO 360 fuel injection. Do you remember what the craft weighed? 2,000. The whole thing weighed 2,000 with two people and the, all the fuel. Quite a bit of weight in here, of course. You know, uh, gyroplanes have to have a low disc loading, so they have to have big rotors. And uh, when you start spinning them up to 50% over speed, you know, you're, you're looking at a lot of weight. What was the rotor diameter 30, on the 30, final one? 37. 37? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 2,000 divided by whatever it is. Loading too, isn't it? I think it was less. Should have been less. Yeah. We tried to, we tried all ways of saving weight, but you know, uh, when you sort of build a rotor, that has to have this sort of rigidity and this type of suspension is, is bound to be a bit sort of heavy. Lots of inertia though, plenty of inertia for takeoff. Yeah, those takeoff, uh, the, the promotional film with the jump takeoff, the quick little circuit and then the beautiful landing, is just unbelievable. I, you know, I, I kind of suspect that if you showed some of these, showed that film, at the PRA convention, you know, there, there's 150 gyroplanes all converge on one place and they fly around all weekend, including air and space and, and uh, 18As, the UMBA yeah. machines, and the, um, uh, what's that other, McCullough, J2s. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, they would just be dueling with, uh, yeah. with envy, I think. Well, they, 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 because uh, they just can't. The UMBA does a jump takeoff, but it's not, not what you saw there. It's different. A different what we operation. Have here is a matter of interest is uh, something extraordinary. I don't think it's been reproduced anywhere else in no. the world, and that is uh, a duct that uh, generated something in the order of 1,200 pounds of thrust, static thrust. That was with the six is, foot. That was a six foot prop, yeah. And uh, I I don't know of any duct that's ever reproduced that. Uh, as a matter of fact. 
certainly so, you don't get it from any unducted prop. That's correct. I think the maximum we ever got out of the uh, six foot uh, uh, prop with the duct top was something around 800 pounds. But uh, the duct really made a big difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where when you, uh, you know, you declutched uh, uh, mm -hmm. and put the power to the rotor, by all that power, the engine just spooled up and actually it overshot, went past the red line, it went up to about uh, 3,100 RPM, I believe. 2,700 was maximum. And it, for you know, a, a fraction of a second, it overshoot. And, uh, and well, then that, you get all that power. <laughs> maybe you should explain that, George, exactly uh, how, how the system worked, the hydraulic system. So yes, that would be yeah, very interesting. Key to, yeah. key to the jump paper. Yeah. Um, so we start the, the engine up and uh, uh, the hydraulic system was attached to the um, collective stick. And we call it a collective stick, but it really wasn't used in flight. Uh, it was used, uh, we pressed down on it to uh, pressurize the hydraulic system. And this would uh, clutch the um, engine into the rotor. And uh, this was a belt drive off the back of the engine. And went up to this little tiny clutch and uh, had to be very careful with it, of course. And then a horizontal uh, universal shaft, uh, an Austin Healy uh, right angled uh, differential would take us up vertically. <laughs> and uh, then we had um, a timing belt drive at the top with a freewheeling clutch. And uh, so the, the clutch was. In the drive shaft or on the rotor head? <coughs> One on the head. Well, on the head. Freewheeling clutch at the head. There was a freewheeling. So on the large pulley, there was hydraulic a hydraulic clutch below it. There was, there was a freewheeling unit. There was a hydraulic clutch at the back of, right above the, uh, right in front of the propeller. That's where the main clutch was, but there was a freewheeling one at the top of the um, uh, drive shaft. What is the difference? I'm sorry. Uh, well, well, it's really a free wheel. It's a one-way one-way clutch. In other words, if you have you have torque driving the shaft to your load, it will it's connected. But if the load exceeds the speed of the shaft, or the shaft stops, there's no no connection. It was an Alice Chambers PTO Helicopters have to have that for disconnecting the rotor from the engine if the engine quits. Well, actually, what, a, what happened was you you had your full pressure on when your stick was down at the bottom, so that your blades were in zero pitch at that point, and the clutch was fully engaged, and you'd rev the thing up. Design speed was 360. We never got there. We got to 330 most of the time. And when everything was fine, the pilot would, uh, he could just pull it up to the lock position if he wanted to, or he could go beyond it. He had all this extra RPM, 360 or 330, and uh, normal flight minimum was 200, but most of the time 240, so you had lots to play with. But that thing would decay so quickly because, of course, it was... Uh, you know, picking the whole aircraft up right. too. They got all this vast amount of thrust from the ductile propeller at the same time. So shutting off your pre-rotator was actually changing the pitch of your rotor. So Absolutely. You yeah. As soon as you pulled up, you declutched, and mm -hmm. it was impossible <coughs> then when you pushed down again in flight if you wanted to do that, it would not engage. The thrust, the, thr the thrust, uh, because the the, the hustle was going in fine pitch. The moment you did this, bang, she went over, and that's where you got the thrust. So you got yeah. uh, which, of course, is good. Uh, that you, if you your propeller, uh, engine propeller, is a flat pitch, then you've got more power to put that's into. That's exactly. So right. were you feeding yeah. like 180 horsepower into the uh, into the you motor bet. for pre spin? Yeah, that's why she read the, went over <laughs> the red line, and, like the engine went over, went over red. The proper RPM was something like 1700. At the time, the uh, the rotor is up at 3:30, and it's in fine pitch. I think it was 7 degrees uh, pitch, something like that. On the propeller. On the prop, yeah. 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 And then, as soon as you declutched or pulled up on the collective, it was all automatic. Yeah. You were, but you got. You were sitting on the ground yeah. one moment, and you were out on the next. And with a lot of thrust. Uh, yeah. Of course, what happened was translating to forward flight. The response time for the for the constant speed unit was uh, such that uh, you would get an overspeed. Just couldn't get. 
uh, wouldn't react fast, fast enough fast to enough. load the engine. never designed to do that. Really. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think that's quite a phenomenal uh, uh, design. That, like you had, you had it really down to a T at that point. I think that's what gave it that tremendous capability. Um, well, we uh, put into effect really on that blue aircraft, the last one that we designed in 1965, everything that we'd learned from the early ones, all this blade design and duct design and propeller design and rotors and everything else, all embodied in that one aircraft. As part of your certification process, did you have to show um, that the machine was dynamically stable in pitch is question one. And the other question is, uh, what about um, reduced G or zero, zero or negative G uh, capability? Did we do negative G? I don't know. I can't recall. No. I mean, you can't do it for a sustained period of time because the blade RPM would decay mm -hmm. if it's not loaded. Like you, you mentioned that the blade RPM look, for a given pitch and for a given gross weight, you know, establishes it's, itself. It's all fixed, yeah. That's it's, right. uh, it's the we forces didn't actually, we, didn't, physics. we didn't have to do any negative G. Uh, what we did have to do was uh, uh, a lot of side slips because uh, Amba had some sort of problems. They had all kinds of red lines, you know, you aren't supposed to bank too much this way or that. And, uh, so the DOT test pilot uh, side slipped the avian at some horrendous angles. <laughs> 60 degrees of side slip, he was telling us last week, and uh, nearly blew the windows out. In fact, he did blow the window out. <laughs> well, another little flight, that was at, uh, that was at Orangeville too, wasn't yeah. it? And, so, uh, uh, the question of pitch stability, um, was there like some uh, qualitative or quantitative way of, of defining what it was? Like, was it neutral or positively uh, stable? We, uh, we did stick speed stability we did tests, and uh, it was uh, very nice, positive base state. And that was all predicted, you know, that the stick would go forward as you increase speed, regardless of uh, yes. center of gravity, even when you have the 50 pounds hanging on the duct. What was the, re what was the retreating blade stall for speed? Um, God, it was. Gosh, I have no idea. It's all sort of patterns of the route on a gyro plane, I think. So. I can't all, I'm just getting it on the computer now, so we didn't have computers, we had slide rules in those days, so <laughs> I've now got my own computer, so... Uh, With a two-bladed rotor, do you, do you get a, do you get a, a definite cycle? <coughs> can, you feel, can you feel it uh, actually hunting along? You mean vibration-wise? Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if it's properly set up, uh, first of all, balance, tip-to-tip -tip and cord mm -hmm. balance, and then uh, tracked, properly tracked, that it's very little vibration. See, because at one point it's actually uh, fore and aft, the whole system is, in a, is literally in a stall situation, isn't it? There's no... Not really, because the speed of rotation is really what governs, is the major uh, velocity over the airfoil. The tip speeds are doing 300, or 300 miles an hour. So, um, whether the wind, the relative wind of, of say your cruise 85 is coming this way or that way, the airfoil is still seeing a positive uh, airflow of, you know, 200 some odd miles an hour. Well, at what it's point a, do you get the into angles. trouble? At what point do you get into trouble with the, <coughs> with, the, with the rotational speed? Well, with forward, high forward speed, yeah, as uh, Gord had mentioned, there is a, the retreating blade, of course, uh, sees less and less airspeed mm -hmm. uh, on the on the retreating side, uh, but because the airflow through the rotor is not the same as a helicopter, mm -hmm. the retreating blade stall uh, comes in gradually, and it starts coming in from the root and working out. So at that point, you would be getting uh, more vibration. I don't think any of us that fly the uh, I don't think there's any machines. generals go that fast, is there? Um, there are high drag configurations, even the streamlined ones possibly uh, could get up into that range in a dive, but I think, you know, you would start to get uh, an indication that you're approaching this area, and most prudent pilots would back off, unless it's some kind of test program with instrumentation and, and whatnot. 
but it's not the on a helicopter that's a different situation where the retreating blade stall can come in very suddenly yeah. mm -hmm. because it starts at the tip where it mm -hmm. where it counts so to speak the, the, the air speeds are much greater there and um, they can get into serious trouble without like uh, without a being able to recover oh, yeah. because once the blade starts doing uh, you know if it gets into serious <laughs> oscillation mm -hmm. you've you literally have sp split seconds to, to do anything, what, what, and that may be too late. What, what are the major problems with the Hondo uh, two-bladed rotor system? Well, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's the fact that it's two-bladed that really has the... Uh, it, it's just that two-bladed is so much simpler mechanically. No, no hinges except for the teeter pin, which is very straightforward. It's at the center, and the, the, the centrifugal loads are taken through the hub not through the through the hinge mm -hmm. um, but it's this uh, uh, pitch stability that I was asking about and although the machines even in the uh, unstreamlined versions are essentially negatively damped or positively damped I should say in pitch mm -hmm. in other words you could if you're flying straight and level give the stick a nudge the machine does not diverge, get into worse and worse off. It actually damps itself out. Yeah. I've done that on my own machine, either through gust inputs or actually hit the stick, just mm -hmm. deflect it. You trim it off so that it's neutral, like you're flying hands off, and you give it a pull back or, or forward, and it just does this. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, there is this a time lag between the input of the pilot and the response of the machine. And I don't know if you experience that kind of thing in the avian, but basically uh, we're, the, air, the aircraft, the airframe is suspended from the rotor through what you might just call a universal joint, like the rotor is tippable through cyclic pitch control, or in our gyros, uh, through essentially is a universal joint. Our cyclic pitch is, is done by tipping the plane of the rotor at its axis <coughs> yeah. by the shaft. That's right. So, yeah. It's very simple mechanically and aerodynamically essentially does the same thing. Mm -hmm. But because of this time lag on the control, there is a uh, possibility of pilot-induced oscillation. <coughs> so the pilot, you know, it starts to climb a little, so he, he puts a little forward pressure. By the time that he, when he first applies it, it's still climbing and not descending, so he puts a little more but then it's too much. Starts to, so he pulls back and you know, and it's a pilot induced oscillation. If you let go of the stick, damps, damps itself out. Or, or pull back on the power. With the, with the, you know, avoiding that oscillation. We, we never had a, a pitching or a long the, There was no, no propensity to, to do that. No, no. I would the only thing we ever saw, you might have saw it in one of the pictures, yeah, films, is that uh, if, if you've got a bad uh, gust, then you get a small nutation. Just a small nutation, a nutational motion of the thing, you know, sort of a... Yes, a bit of a, out. a dance. It's a dance possibility, possibility, too, there was very few novice, inexperienced pilots flying your machines, I would guess. Yeah. I mean, they That's may true. be inexperienced on that machine, but they're definitely experienced pilots otherwise. Well, this is where the U18 got into trouble, as they, they oversold the concept. And um, they would let people take the plane straight up from the factory. And uh, quite a few were killed on the runway outside their own factory. Well, the, well, the, the, the fact <laughs> remains, though, that n neither of the pilots were accomplished uh, rotary pilots. They were fixed wing pilots, both of them. And, matter of fact, the first uh, pilot that uh, flew Her Her Harold Kaler, he got his rotary license after. <laughs> I suspect though, the, the majority of pilots who have had problem with, with pilot-induced oscillation yeah. in uh, Benson-type gyros are all inexperienced pilots, yeah, period. Yeah. Inexperienced or fixed-wing pilots? Well, either way. Because it, it even, does handle even, differently. It's yeah, but even as a, a fixed-wing pilot, we haven't had, as far as I know, we no. haven't had any any 10,000 hour fixed wing pilots screw up in gyros either. Probably because at some point in time they do experience pilot induced oscillation or were taught about it and knew what it was <coughs> and therefore how to counteract it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
The sailplane pilots, training, for example, training on, defect more than anything else. Yeah. On uh, can experience it, especially on toll. There's sometimes uh, this business starts to occur in the porpoising. The porpoising, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's really pilot-induced oscillation. If you yeah. uh, you have to change something, <clears throat> either let go of the stick or hold the stick steady. It's not going to oscillate. No. You might be diving or climbing, but you get a, have to get away from that oscillation. Well, you know, the solution is uh, the same solution that was used for this uh, uh, this uh, phenomenon that we, we encountered that Gordon has described. Oh, yeah. You just to take your hands off the stick. It cures itself. Yeah. Don't mess around with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one has attempted to certify one of these at all in any form. No, they've basically been designed in the uh, home build category, let's say as a universal term, uh, as a kit sure. or scratch built uh, design. Um, the, uh, in the UK. Is the guy that's got that, that weird looking one that he's using for African relief or something in the, in the, the trag? third or for fourth world countries or wherever the hell it is? He's talking about certification? Something like that. Possible, yeah. possibly, but uh, I, you know, there's there's extremely few uh, projects that ever have existed, let alone like in, in progress now for for type certification. Mm -hmm. The uh, McCullough J2 and the Umbach or Air and Space 18A mm -hmm. were, I think, the only two you know, post-war type certificated gyroplanes. There were, of course, the big carriers. And who? And the Oh, it, it, I was going to say in the U.S., but you're right. You had type certification in the U.S. Yes, at first. When, when yeah, was, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. Wasn't there a project in Australia? There was a, there was a, a, a oh, gyro. There was a, was it the gyro uh, yes, there was. Australia. A two-seater with one seat be sort of beside the other, but yeah, in front of I, it. I, I, sort of name escaped not me, side by but side. But that, was, that was also part of, quote, unquote, a competition. I think, yeah, yeah. There was, there was the Kushyamba and, and the one, and I forget the name, it was an Australian. Yeah. Yes, I recall that, uh, reading about it I in our 20-year-ago uh, well, PR we one of the PRA magazine. Do you remember that? You don't remember the name by any chance? Yeah. <laughs> I remember, uh, well, it was a sort of utility vehicle. It didn't have any doors on it or anything like that. Yeah. I, I don't know what they used it for quite. Oh, well, it, it, uh, it didn't leave until quite recently, actually. It went from Georgetown to Listowel, which is uh, sort of about uh, 86, northwest of uh, yeah. London way, anyway. Uh, and uh, it stayed there for a while, and uh, they got it flying again. And, uh, Did they actually fly? Oh, yeah. They, well, they hired Grant Davison to fly it. Oh. I mean, but I don't know. You can't do anything without a, an engineering department or some mm -hmm. shop or something, you know. I mean, it's just a pipe dream. Yeah. So it sort of stayed there for a while, and then the next thing I heard, it was in Pincher Creek, Alberta. So uh, I was all set to go out there this year. And then I got a telephone call from Palo Alto, California, and the fellow announced that he'd bought the, he had bought the aircraft. From Pincher Creek? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think it ever got to Pincher Creek. I don't know quite where it went in between. What but did he pay? <laughs> no idea. I did ask. We, we've, we've been hearing that it got sold to, uh, to California for about three years. Oh, yeah. And the going price in the rumor for what it's worth was 50000 bucks. Well, that's probably about right. <laughs> because I think it left Listowell. Because I remember I finally, like, I tracked it down one time in Listowell and then. I went to Harvey Cross, the car dealer. Oh, yeah. And he took me to some barn yeah. somewhere and it was covered in bird droppings and I almost was in tears because <laughs> oh. I, I can remember, of course, the way it was. And, you know, the stuff was just, it was just totally, you know, uh, <coughs> abandoned and, and obviously nobody had, had any care for, for, for an aircraft. You mean, you see that. Was that the blue one? That was the blue one, yeah. yeah. It's it it JTO. Awful. Mm. Anyway, but then I heard that, that somebody from California came and bought that whole. Lock, stock, and barrel from Listowel. Oh, yeah. And then it went to California. Well, now, how did it pack into Canada? I don't know, but. Um, well, it's, it's now down in Taylor. But obviously, now it sounds like it's back in California again. Yeah. 
So this is only one craft we're referring to, not the business as a group of Palo Alto. They're not trying to restart going for the Just well, maybe be a historical collector's item. Yeah, but the company that bought it originally, I think, uh, thank you, uh, okay. Uh, I guess they, they bought the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel. I guess to a list of them. drawings and everything went, as far as I know. The drawings are all gone. But then it was a fire in the slow. Yes. Fire. Uh, yeah. Did you care for some of these? So these folk in, in California don't have any drawings? They've got nothing other than the airplane. Uh, the, the jigs, well, all the jigs go. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I thought they you know, Ken Gamble bought a bunch of stuff. I don't know him or not. He buys anything that used to fly or still flies or maybe yeah. flew. Uh, he tells a story about your your fiberglass ducks because he has he has a aircraft junkyard down there. Yeah. And he talk, tells a story about the ducks not being cylindrical every time. They got a decent wind, the damn things would get up and start rolling across the fields. And when he went to retrieve them, they wouldn't roll back. Because they're tapered. Roll in circles. Cone. Cone. <laughs> 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 You'd have to steer it, you know, roll it a bit and steer it. Now, I don't know how much stuff he's got, and Ken doesn't let facts interfere with telling a good story. <laughs> <laughs> how much uh, increased diameter that uh, prop duck? Uh, it, uh, it's like a cone shape. Uh, the forward speed scoops of the air. It's three degrees. Three degrees. Yeah. So that way the chap, when he had to gyro down from the empty tank, had rudder control with a little three degree air scoop increase in the airflow to the rudder. Oh, no, uh, it, it was not enough because the diameter is six feet. It, you know, hardly made any difference. I think it was, uh, duck was two feet, uh, something in the order of two feet uh, long. So three degrees didn't make very much difference to that. But he had directional stability. Uh, yeah. 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 Normally, the requirement is that you have more vertical, like for yaw control yeah. and for pitch control, you have to have more vertical or, or surface area in that plane aft of the center of gravity than you have forward. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it'll tend to weather way in the other way around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. And of course, that's what the duct, in fact, did. It was your yeah. tail surfaces, both horizontal and vertical. And then the rudder in the middle was the controlling surface uh, for for yaw, mm -hmm. and of course in pitch you had the rotor, cyclic uh, control of the rotor. Mm -hmm. It's the same uh, with our types of machines. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, home builders uh, take artistic license with the design, you know, and, and uh, end up with the surface areas reversed. While power is on and the, the rudder is normally in the slipstream of the propeller, you're fine. Mm -hmm. But if the engine quits, yeah. you might be in trouble because the thing would tend to weather vane and it would try to turn itself to go backwards. Uh, yeah, to say the least. Um, when you were talking about the amount of thrust you had, was that static thrust, static yeah. test? Yes. And when last time we tested your machine, what did we get? Do you remember? Well, let's put it this way. Not the last time we tried it. The well, best I ever okay, got was about 285. So you're getting 285 with a what about a 48, 50 inch prop? 40, yeah, four foot prop. Uh, and and uh, about 80 yeah. horsepower. Something like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, somewhere between the standard and the super, <laughs> Makala. And you're getting 1,200 out of 100 and not 200 horse. 50 percent growth uh, increase in thrust. From the duct? Yes. Fifty percent. Yes. Well, I'm going to go I buy think one. You better go <laughs> home and start carving. Hold on, you have to you have to bear in mind that. Uh, the, the thrust recovery on the duct uh, is, is short-lived. It doesn't take too much forward speed to kill it. So, so at, at a decent cruise speed, the duct isn't, isn't well, doing much? Is that what you're saying? That's right. That's right. You get up, uh, you get up in speed, the oh, I see. thrust recovery drops out very sharply. So it does so, a lot of good for static thrust. So it does a lot of so good for So which is fine for your takeoff. Speed end of it. When, when, yeah. when you really need it for, for a jump takeoff. What would the duct itself weigh? God, I can't remember. Was it 60 pounds? What that it, was it was very light. <coughs> yeah, it was very light. No. Well, you know, there's, the, like I said before, like has been mentioned, the duct is, is essentially all your stabilizing tail surfaces. If you didn't have the duct and you had to put those surfaces out there, you, down the space you, you would have, there's, that's one heck of a headache because you need a pylon out there yeah. and then these things sticking out. Yeah. The duct does that all very nicely besides giving you 
this uh, added bonus of, yeah. of the high thrust at, uh, at low airspeed, as I guess it turns out. At zero or exactly. low airspeed, which uh, I guess is, yeah, that's, that's certainly something. I mean, more thrust is always uh, a goal. Um, but of course, this, when you're talking about a six foot, 72 inch diameter of the propeller, that's a propeller and not a, not a fan. And the ducts were utilized uh, apparently to good advantage on ducted fans, where for other cons uh, reasons you want to keep the diameter small. Mm -hmm. But there was then a multi blade, like it may be four or even six or, or high more blades. Uh, high solidity. Yes. Yeah. Who was the guy who was killed? Uh, that was long enough. He was what he was doing was perforating the whole duct and sucking the air through the. Says, he was killed in. Uh, we, he, he was from uh, an American university in the south. We used a lot of his information. The guy, Jim uh, Beatty did a lot of work with uh, that kind of thing a long time ago. But he, I, I, he's, he's still kicking around. No, this guy was yeah. killed. Yeah. Um, was that the, the Jim Beatty? Yeah, yeah. We talked with Jim Beatty. He, he did some work uh, back in those days. He, he uh, monkeyed around with uh, ducks and things like that. And he was on to. Boundary layer control with uh, you know suction. Yes. Boundary layer suction perforated yes. uh, surfaces and you suck the stuff off. And he messed around with the uh, ducks. Uh, he didn't really. I, I don't think he really had an opportunity to develop his uh, ducted uh, propulsion system. He just used ordinary. I mean, uh, David Durbin, uh Harcel guys were just around the corner from where he was, and uh, he just got props and stuck them in without doing anything to them. You know, Harcel props, big props, and stuck them in the dock. They were just tapered props. They weren't. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't props squared off. Yeah. You know. So um, I don't think really got into it that much. I think yeah. it's fancy. The guys that are working on them today are the fellows with these little. Uh, uh, what do you call them? Hovercraft. Hovercraft. Because they're using they're using like like uh, thirty inch diameter props and they're going at 5,000 RPM or something. Direct drive to small two-stroke engines, yeah. yeah. Little, uh, uh, very, very narrow board blades and three or four or seven or nine or whatever they feel fits that day. <laughs> and they're getting some decent results with them. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, the, the unfortunate, uh, I wouldn't say demise, but the, uh, the, the uh, inability of the avian project to go forward past uh, certification is definitely a, um, an unfortunate situation. I think the world would have been a lot better off if it uh, really got off the ground into production. Um, it would be interesting to follow up what the current situation is with that machine. Someone had mentioned that, uh, well, it was at uh, Listowel that there was a fire. And yeah, the, and the, the drawings and drawings went. But what I heard not so long ago, I was talking to another fellow who was um, part of another company that, that financially supported me. Yeah. The general manager of that, as far as he's retired now, um, he said that a lot of drawings, I don't know whether all the drawings, that, they, that the Thermoelectric was another company um, that got a copy of each of the drawings, like a fire copy. So when he retired, he sent all those drawings to Ottawa, so there's a fair amount of drawings oh, I see. of the avian well, in Ottawa to, to the museum, I think. Oh, and not the museum in Ottawa. Would, have, would uh, Ottawa Transport Canada have had them as part of the certification? Well, that too, but I think they only like got the copy, copy of the drawing, everything. he was saying. Yeah, but was it, um, they also got them at uh, DOT. DOT, yes. You know, they'd have a picture of the road at home and all this stuff. That's pretty surprising, like Captain. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This the the again getting back to the rotor hub. Um, this was sort of a handcrafted, uh, complicated, uh, or how complicated really was it? it well, it wasn't that complicated. It was a. Uh, it had a history, didn't it? <laughs> uh, you mean a development history, yeah. or otherwise? Well, it was a, polite, uh, polite term. Right. It was a. Um, it was a big. Aluminum forging, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was just a one piece, sort of like a mushroom, and, uh, uh, and all sort of cut out from a, a, a forged trunk. 
And we had certain uh, stress limits given to us by any national air and audio establishment. If we didn't exceed them, the thing would last forever. So we did some sort of rather elementary stress analysis and we uh, built the hub and uh, put it in a test machine and pulled it to simulate uh, 360 RPM and uh, we were within about 1% of what we predicted and no one believed us. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the stress levels were so low that um, we had infinite life on that. The hub was supported on, on bearings to a stationary shaft? Um, in the, like on the top yeah, of the pylon? Right, yeah, 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 that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was a sort of toothed uh, um, wheel underneath which took the belt from the drive, which was an aluminum uh, toothed uh, pulley. But then it was also a, a welded hub. Well, we had a welded hub earlier. Was that, was that, was that was before that? Yeah. That was a marriaging steel oh, fabrication, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. That was well, pre preceding <laughs> that, we had yeah. the, the two plate hub. Well, that's right. We had a top and bottom plate with a space. We actually had a, a, a built up hub, which was really simple. Just two plates and, uh, and these forks sticking out. You know, to take these. Is it bolted or welded? It was all bolted. And, uh, sometimes I sort of wonder, you know. Why did, we, why did we move away from that? Was it the sheer only. Much better for home construction to be bolted. <laughs> 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 plates, you know. Probably the weight, I don't know. Oh, but the welded one, though. Probably not. <laughs> not recommended. <laughs> well, we exhausted all our questions. I, I'm sure people will be thinking of questions that they could have asked afterwards. Well, the Howard Kaler, yes. uh, your test pilot, is that the same Howard that was the stock car racer? No, no this is Harold. Harold Kaler. Harold. Harold Kaler. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think the, the names are so familiar. Yeah, yeah, I think it was similar. I think he used to ride, actually, he used to race motorcycles um, before the war. Yeah. How, how would you spell his last name? Just for K O E H L E R. Well, I, when I was at Arenda, I worked with a Harold Kohler, and he had now at Ontario High. He's just retired from Ontario High, but I'm. So I don't think so, this, but it, this it's a uh, bush pilot, and uh, he used to spend all his time <laughs> up north, and uh, just fantastically things these fellows do. Well, I think if uh, if it's gone back to the U.S. and if somebody's serious about it, that's probably the best place that it. You know, if it's going to go. That's where it's going to go. Some Yankee will get the backing and uh, and uh, possibly put it back into production. It'll be very interesting to see if they do, and I hope that they, if if they do, that they keep that lineage intact. You know, they they uh, acknowledge where it came from, and. Uh, I I guess so, but I mean, <laughs> you really are dreaming today. We would we we would all know where it came from. Um, it uh, you know the the uh, even the looks of the machine, you know, are are so much better than anything else that was type certificated. And in fact, any of the there's some pretty sleek looking uh, uh, amateur category or, or home build category in the U.S. Uh, uh, composite machines now. Uh, one of the drawbacks of them, though, is that they're still heavier than a bolted aluminum frame. Now, mind you, they're fully enclosed, the aluminum frame ones aren't, and you have the same problem that you had with the steel tube-type frame, and then you've got, like, basic structure, uh, skeleton, let's say, and then you have to put all these ribs and things on, and a skin. Well, well wait a minute, the wind rider is... It's is all composite. It's, it's a monocoque. It's a monocoque. But it's in, in composite material like fiberglass, Kevlar. Or yeah, but it's not, it's not the, the... It's heavy. What about this RAF 2000? I'm looking at it in the magazine from Calgary. Yeah, or Edmonton, Edmonton. area. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's an outgrowth of a, of a, of a fella, Bernie Haslow, who actually started toying with rotorcraft at the end of the Second World War. And 
came up with something very similar to the Benson machine. I think he basically, when the Benson machine started becoming available, he sort of took off on that concept. But he did make some other changes to it. And what they have now is um, sort of his configuration of a basic cruciform, three major structural members, tubes, covered in now with the fiberglass uh, enclosure. Now, I think in the fiberglass enclosure, they really don't have any uh, strengthening ribs in it. It just uh, bolts into position in a few spots. They have to obviously have some connections to the frame, but there's no stiffening longer arms or, or ribs, mm -hmm. which it looked like you had on the original concept. Of course, the aluminum monocoque, if it's done right, would be the way to go. is the way to go. It's uh, so strong and light. Um, although, you know, for for home built use, it's it would take a you know four times the amount of time to build, and you have to have proper jigs to to well, rig it properly. You, but uh, there are there are um, many fixed wing home builds. Uh, Thorpe T18 and, yeah, and, and, and that and that which are monocoque designs and, and, just, and just millions of rivets. <laughs> if you're careful on the shape, you can do it without compound curves. That that machine that was sitting beside us at the show, uh, the hell was it called? Which way? Hummel the Hummel one bird. with the half, half, bird. half the Hummelbird with the half VW in it is all flat sheet with about two yeah. pieces exceptions. Yeah, at the compound and, curves. And, and boy, it's a sleek looking aluminum. Yeah, we've yeah. had uh, a flat, a completely flat bottom and uh, just straight lines. It doesn't look like it, but uh, the whole of the front fuselage was just straight lines, no compounds. Just the fiberglass nose. Yes. We had, and then the, and of course, the bottom uh, canopy. That was it. Yeah. Are you saying, Jerry, that the, co the newest composites are heavier than? And well, I'm saying that the, the gyroplanes that have been designed using that system end up like a single seat machine and it's, uh, I would say, at least 100 pounds heavier than... That wind rider is that much heavier? Yeah, than it's like it's 450 pounds empty with the 65 horse uh, uh, Rotax. Now, it's, it's very weight? streamlined, but so it gets very good performance. What's yours weight? My empty weight is... Uh, it's under 300 pounds. Do you remember Dale's reaction when we weighed his uh, black magic? No. He said he didn't believe your scales, I'm sure. He said the scales were completely wrong. And it was, Why, four, but it was, it was 460. OK. That's a Volkswagen engine I don't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. The, the, my reaction to when I saw the article on it, the first one which described some of the characteristics and the design parameters, was, gee, that's a heavy empty weight. For what, if monocoque, you know, new, new age materials, yeah, but I thought, well, gee, I mean, the whole uh, purpose of it is to have a real lightweight, strong st structure. But to get you could probably do better in aluminum. Out of that sort of stuff, you've got to be, you can't do it in your backyard. You've no, got to, no. You've got Sophisticated uh, curing, sophisticated engineering, well, that's the and that's one of the reasons them, yeah. why the DOT isn't really fond of that stuff. You'd have to go into Kevlar. Yeah. No, that and, uh, you, you need a you need someone who knows how to use that material, a in the <clears throat> design stage and then b in the fabrication yeah. stage. Yeah, I don't think it's critical. All that suitable all critical for things. Well, you know the 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 large uh, the big. Helicopter companies. There's no such thing as small helicopter companies because they can't afford anything. Oh well, yeah, they're the helicopter. Robinson and it's not a small one anymore. The um, composite rotor blades and even rotor heads are now being produced. Uh, the uh, French. It's a conglomerate. Uh, Aeros uh, Aerospecial. Yeah. Their helicopter. Uh, branch has been working on composite designs for quite some time, but it you know it takes millions in, uh, and you just keep feeding the project until you get it done. Mm -hmm. But they're talking about completely composite rotor heads and rigid rotor heads. French are very aggressive and with that kind of material. Yeah, and they, they're Boeing and uh, some of the other American, uh, you know, Bell. 
mm-hmm. are getting into that too in a, in a big way. Mm-hmm. The, um, besides the actual uh, fuselage structures. And they have certain advantages, um, like field repairability, you know, for these gunship things uh, in, in battle and whatnot. There's, you know, there's all kinds of repair techniques, but the, developed and, and certified and all the rest of it. But um, what intrigues me really is these composite, all composite rotor heads. It's interesting because uh, uh, I guess that uh, they, they use these very carefully, uh, line up the fibers and whatever that goes into it so that um, you don't run into the fatigue problems that, that they used to face a long time ago. With you can tailor your, your stiffnesses and, and uh, ultimate strengths yeah. almost in any direction for the loads that you're going to have. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I just wonder about hanging up there on a piece of plastic. It's kind of, I, well, I, it's I kind of feel strong. it's kind of risky still. It's not really, you know, like, Seattle has not gone that bullish with it. And uh, uh, when you look at, for instance, uh, the French, they've gone into the ATR-72, has got a lot of composite materials in it, and they use it for, uh, they get into primary structure with it as well. If we stay, stayed away from it because it's unknown. You know, it may look good now, and you may sustain fatigue tests, but then there's, uh, so environmental conditions. There's uh, what happens with age, with light, ultraviolet degradation, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, yeah, corrosion, you know, like well, the atmospheric. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it'll come though. Look, at the, come, look sure. at the original reaction to to uh, to no direct mechanical connection between the stick and control surfaces. Yeah, no way. Fly by wire. Yeah, now it's fly, fly by, by wire. You know. No, it's fly by light. Yeah, fiber optics. Yeah. Forget the wire. It's lighter. Yeah. Using uh, composite rotors of second, the, oh, yes, the, 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 the new 400 and the 777. Yeah, they use. Yeah, so I'm not saying it's not used. We, we've got a lot of composite materials in the, you know, the dash, dash eight. Oh, I see that. Yeah. But uh, it's how you use them, and we, we, we don't mm-hmm. use, we haven't yeah, used them in primary use. structures. Oh, I see. But they're getting into that now. I mean, get using it. Well, the dash eight's risky. Uh, it's over 20 percent, isn't it, on a lot of the uh, yeah, lines, on the dash eight yeah. on that now? Yes, yeah. On the dash eight, the problem running to is repair on them, but they know we had repair on them, so they're having, they're not too sure how to repair them properly. So this is one of the big deals comes up. Yeah, I don't know much about that. So. Now, if I had a spare sheet of paper, I was going to. Anybody, you got a spare sheet of paper? Mm-hmm. I was going to circulate a, a list for people to put their names down. I brought this big wad of paper and I thought it was all. Well, you want to put a pen to it and uh, <coughs> yeah. circulate it? There you go. Um, you thought I built a small gyro? <laughs> you know how to build a small gyro now? I don't know. I mean, all that technology, I mean. Yeah, I see some not making use of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of us here, of course, have uh, an interest in the small machines, but um, something like the Avian, especially since it was down here in Ontario and, and not too far from from where we are right now, um, sort of adds uh, piques everyone's interest. Certainly does mine. I, mm-hmm. I about the rest of the, the people here, but there's a number of uh, uh, like you say, you used the final prototype had all the sum of, of uh, knowledge and, and experience, and I think back in what was it, 67, you got the Canadian type certification? 68. Or 68. Um, back so long ago, and, you know, there's still no, if it was available today, there probably wouldn't be any competition. Or the competition just couldn't stack up to it. Well, a lot of it would depend on, that, that thing was almost as complicated in some aspects as a, as a full-fledged helicopter. Uh, mechanically, you mean? And it would I guess there a are. Great deal on you want the name and addresses? Yes, please. No, they know us. We're here all the time. 
and I, it would a lot would depend on on. You don't want to lose your name, uh, your address, just your name. Yeah. Would retail yeah, for it? Yeah, sure, that's right. Like that that rotorway is exact right now, or or whatever their current model is. Um, that's a kit, helicopter, of course. It's a helicopter. The kit's going for about fifty thousand dollars, U.S. give or take a few thousand. With well, that, that latest magazine's had thirty nine U.S. Thirty nine U.S. Yeah. Wow. Price but that's going down. Um, yeah, Marcus, we, uh, we had done, and, and Donna probably knows a lot more about it than I do, but uh, we had done market surveys, that is, uh, uh, price demand surveys. And uh, I think uh, back in those days, uh, there was a survey that showed that if we could sell the airplane for $12,000, 12, $12, then there would be a market for some 3,000 of them. But as the price came up, get it, you know, up to... Uh, more practically realizable levels, like twenty thousand, the market dropped down very suddenly, sharply. Yeah, at that right. time, the Hughes two six nine A was <clears throat> was selling for around about twenty eight to thirty two thousand dollars, and uh, they were not making any money when they when they put it on the market. But um, <clears throat> the, the essential thing to remember about the jar thing was that what we were after was getting away from a helicopter pilot's license. What um, what use did you anticipate it being put to? We had worldwide interest. Um, for instance, Bowater uh, Paper Company were, were going to use them for uh, for forest uh, <coughs> survey work. We had um, I always remember one guy came in, uh, was interested in buying two. He was a veterinarian, and he was putting 90,000 miles a year on his car. 90,000 miles a year on his car. And uh, most of his productive time was spent driving. Mm -hmm. So obviously, he was a uh, veterinarian for a horse racing, racing crowd. So he built he the flyer thing in. Um, pipeline people um, were interest, very interested in it. What, OPP, what, what yeah. sort of range or, or duration did, did it have, or would it, would it have had in, in, well, in production? Wait, what, what was our maximum? Was it, was it was in the neighborhood of 200, 50 to 300, 300 miles range. Yeah. Was that that was area. Area. I thought it was a Well, it depends what you want to sacrifice. Well, yeah. It was a range relationship, but with, uh, you know, with, with three passengers. Yeah. Two passengers and a pilot. Mm -hmm. It was designed, we, we couldn't make it a three place, you see, we, we actually had... What was that, right? Oh, yeah. Three, three was it on the, the, the rear seat? The back, yeah, the back seat. I the see. Back seat. Oh. Seat. But it was only certified for two, so... So, so basically, you could have taken over any, any role a helicopter could have done with the obvious exceptions of... Over uh, the role of the helicopter, better than the helicopter. Well, with a couple of exceptions. Oh, well, well. Yeah. Hovering. hovering. Yeah, hovering and lifting. But, uh, I mean, if you've had any experience of, of the, the terrors of helicopter flight, and you know all of the, you know, the dead man's curve and all these things, why anyone would want to fly a helicopter to be on me? Well, there are, there are <laughs> specific applications that, uh, for example, uh, equipment craning, like we saw on the CN Tower in 1975, and, you know, no, you special things like or oh, yeah. rescue. You could have done Rescue. it with an auto gyro. The, the guys bolting it on would have had it been quicker. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Take another run at it. They, they, could have, they could have done it. With no I want to take this opportunity to thank not only Gord, but also his cohorts in this project for coming out to the meeting tonight. Um, and I would uh, like you to join me in a round of applause to show our appreciation. Now, I, I brought some refreshments for our guests. There may be some overflow for the rest of you. I would uh, um, petition our members to uh, stay to the end of the line, okay? <laughs> if there's any left, we'll uh, just pop the screen up. Right. Is the government interested in putting one of these in the museum anytime? Or building them off? Be careful for them often.